Okay. Uh, so this is our method of policy reading group. We are continuing our reading of structures of behavior. We are at page 145 of the translation at the heading vital structures. Um, so we're on, uh, I think this is the third chapter, if I'm, yes, the third chapter. In this chapter, he's going through these uh, sort of three orders of behaviors, the, the physical, vital, and human orders. So these are sort of three ways of describing behavior uh, or three uh, aspects of behavior, and they're ordered in the sense that uh, each one is uh, dependent on the one that comes before in some sense, uh, or uh, maybe another way of putting it would be that um, each each of these uh, orders of behavior is uh, a sort of more sophisticated uh, um, articulation of what happens at the previous level. So obviously the physical level is like the most fundamental um, you can't have a vital order without a physical order, um, but the the vital order is not um, sort of reducible to the physical order uh, in the sense that like you might you might sort of uh, want to explain the vital order as being some like maybe complicated uh, abbreviation for something happening at the physical uh, level, uh, and so that that reductive um, uh, sort of procedure is something that Maclaponti is going to criticize throughout this chapter, uh, and so he's going to. You know, argue that we we can't actually make this uh, reduction, uh, and so that's what we looked at last time in the section on the structures in physics. Um, and so he looked at um, so he, he's here he's criticizing um, some of the Gestalt psychology theorists who did try to do this sort of reduction process in uh, in a different way than than say the um, reflex theory people. But like so, one of the ideas of this kind of reduction was that um, so instead of saying that, like, uh, we're going to identify, uh, like, this experience is uh, identified with this uh, cell in the brain or something like that, um, the idea was that uh, you would identify these processes or these uh, principles of um, how things happen in experience, uh, and then you would identify uh, some sort of isomorphic or uh, similar or, or analogous principle happening at the physical level and say that... Um, these are like the the principle um, that governs the events in experience is the same principle as the one that governs the events in the physical world. Um, so, like one sort of example of this is uh, in our perception, there are these uh, good forms uh, that Gestalt psychology sort of uh, built itself built the whole theory around. So things like uh, uh, a circle, a triangle, etc. These are like um, there's a certain uh, sort of balance, I guess. Like, if you see a circle, it, it just looks sort of correct or, like, adequate in a, in a way that, say, like, a slightly uh, misshaped circle looks misshaped. Uh, it, you, can, you see it as, like, a, a, a deformed circle as opposed to, like, just a, a line on a page. Um, so there are these, like, forms, these, these shapes that have this quality of being sort of adequate or, like... Uh, in some sense, like a, a resting place of perception that like when you see this perfect circle or perfect triangle or whatever, it, it looks like sort of, uh, you know, a, um, a sort of solid perceptual um, shape, I guess. Um, and then uh, this sort of process of like resting on these uh, good forms is compared to uh, the way that, for example, um, a soap bubble forms a spherical shape just through the the minimization of surface tension. Um, so there's, there's no like sort of uh, uh, you know intelligence involved in you know putting uh, a spherical shape onto the soap bubble. It's just this physical process of minimizing surface tension that brings about um, the spherical shape. Uh, so like the idea here is that there would be some sort of uh, analogy between this physical process of minimizing surface tension to produce this regular shape, and then within the perceptual realm or perceptual world, there would be the, a similar kind of process uh, that brings about these uh, regular forms like a, a circle or a triangle. Um, and yeah, so this is like the, the sort of Gestalt psychology um, uh, explanation of how these uh, two levels are related to each other. Um, and yeah, so Metaponti is um, critical of this approach uh, for well a few different reasons um, that we looked at last time, but one is um so he yeah in in that section that we read last time he gives uh it's a fairly dense uh and quick but like a, a sort of um 
philosophy of science uh, analysis of what exactly we mean when we talk about uh, like laws, for example, in at the physical level. Um, and um, the one thing he points to is the fact that uh, our understanding of a physical process in terms of a law of nature or a physical law um, is always uh, a sort of abstraction in the sense that uh, Okay, like the law of gravitation, the uh, the law of fall of heavy bodies, for example, it, it's only true um, uh, in a vacuum. Um, and assuming that there are no other forces involved, like magnetic fields or whatever. Um, so, uh, of course, in like normal circumstances, when there is air, uh, if you drop uh, a bowling ball and an equally heavy bag of feathers, they do not fall at the same velocity. Um, uh, so the the law of the fall of bodies is not um, literally true in that case, uh, and and we explain that in terms of the sort of fundamental law is the same, but then the the air resistance sort of interferes with the uh, um, manifestation of that law. But um, the the sort of principle that um, we're meant to draw from this kind of example is that um, our understanding of um, physical processes that have been governed by laws is always an abstraction. We're always isolating some aspect of the phenomenon and saying uh, this aspect um, in isolation has this you know, is governed by this law. But of course, in reality, it, that aspect is never isolated. Uh, it's all, there are always a million different aspects of a phenomenon that are all interacting with each other to produce the, the you know, real observed um, uh, events in the physical world. Um, and and precise like an experiment is precisely an attempt to isolate as much as possible one phenomenon or a small number of of aspects of a phenomenon, and and then see what happens in that circumstance when when other um, conditions are are controlled. So you you uh, for example you don't do your experiment like out in the middle of a field or like at a bus stop or something. You do it in inside a a, a room in a laboratory with you know air conditioning, the temperature is controlled, etc. Uh, you try to control any other factors that might interfere with the um, uh, sort of process you're interested in. Um, uh, but then, so the other side here, of course, is that not every, so even though there, there are many um, other sort of aspects that in the in the real world are sort of uh, interacting with each other, uh, it's not the case that every single aspect of the world is equally relevant to every other aspect. Um, I think the example I used last time is if you're doing like a chemistry experiment, you don't have to take account uh, of the weather on Jupiter, uh, you know, what sort of cloud formations are, are happening there. Um, uh, you, can, you can safely ignore that, uh, you know, phenomenon happening millions of kilometers away um, uh, when, you're, when you're performing your experiment. And so if it, if it were not the case, if it were the case that every single aspect of the world was equally relevant to every other aspect of the world, it would be impossible to do science or to, you know, uh, perform an experiment because you could never isolate any elements of the world. Uh, so we have to have a, a sort of understanding of the world um, as um, sort of differentially articulated in the sense that um, certain aspects of the world are relevant and uh, interact with each other, uh, whereas others are less relevant. Um, and, and have less impact on each other. Um, and so it's this sort of uh, differential articulation of the world that is what makes science possible you know, at, at the physical level. Um, uh, and so, um, yeah, and, and then sort of, sort of understanding this, so this understanding of uh, the relationship between like the structure of the world and the possibility of science uh, is what Mathilde Ponty appeals to um, in his criticism of Gestalt psychology. So we can only ever understand a law, uh, a physical law, as being something that comes about through this process of abstraction from uh, a, a concrete process, um, some you know, uh, physical, some development of some aspect of the world. Um, but the the Gestalt psychology explanation sort of um, disconnects this. Uh, physical law from the concrete um, process uh, that, out, of, out of which it's abstracted and, and, and sets the physical law uh, as sort of the, the fundamental um, uh, element as something that exists uh, in itself separate from the abstraction process uh, that, that brings it about. Um, so for, for Medlin-Ponsi, this is like um, sort of 
uh, putting the relationship between the the law of the physical law and the concrete phenomenon backwards. Um, you're treating uh, an abstraction uh, from the concrete process as being the reality that uh, brings about the concrete process. Um, um, yeah, exactly. So it, it's sort of a, a reification of uh, something that is a, a product of an intellectual um, activity or intellectual exercise that you you and not purely intellectual, but also experimental. Like you set up an experiment to isolate a, a particular um, aspect of a phenomenon. Um, but yeah, so once you've isolated this aspect and set up this law governing that aspect of the evolution of this um, concrete phenomenon, you then sort of turn around and say this this law is more fundamental. It's, it's like the the reality that um, brings about the phenomenon. Uh, and so this is yeah is a sort of reversal of the the um, actual relationship between the the concrete phenomenon and the law that is abstracted from it. Yeah, so I think that's sort of the, I mean, he goes through more sort of specific examples, but I think that's like the general um, uh, sort of argument, the, the general um, trend of the argument in, uh, against that, that form of explanation. So yeah, it, it's, it's sort of uh, a, a closer look at what exactly uh, a law of nature or a physical law would mean and uh, an argument on the basis of that, that we can't um, uh, sort of try to explain um, like laws of uh, experience or these principles governing um, the perceived world on the basis of these um, physical laws that are actually derived from that uh, concrete world. Um, so that's, that's sort of like the general um, argument. Uh, but then, so the next bit is going to be about um, the structures at the vital level. So that's where we, we, we can start today. Um, uh, yeah, so if someone wants to read from the heading Vital Structures uh, on page 145. Uh, I can read. Vital Structures. The physical form is an equilibrium obtained with respect to certain given external conditions. Whether it is a question of topographical conditions, as in the distribution of electrical charges on a conductor, or of conditions which are themselves dynamic, as in the case of a drop of oil placed in the middle of a mass of water. Doubtless certain physical systems modify the very conditions upon which they depend by their internal evolution, as shown by the polarization of electrodes in the case of electrical current. And one can imagine some which are capable of displacing their mobile parts so as to reestablish a privileged state. But action which is exercised outside the system always has the effect of reducing a state of tension, of advancing the system toward rest. We speak of vital structures, on the contrary, when equilibrium is obtained not with respect to real and present conditions, but with respect to conditions which are only virtual and which the system ex itself brings into existence. When the structure, instead of procuring a release from the forces with which it is penetrated through the pressure of external ones, executes a work beyond its proper limits and constitutes a proper milieu for itself. In a system of this kind, the equilibrium that the internal reactions tend to produce is not an equilibrium gained at any cost, nor the simple conservation of an established order, as in the distribution of electrical charges. The privileged state, the invariant, can no longer be determined as the result of reciprocal actions which actually unfold in the system. It is known, for example, that an organism never realizes all the types of behavior that would appear possible if it were considered as a machine. If a subject points an object points at an object placed in front of him, then on his right, and finally on the extreme right, one observes that trunk movements are executed at the same time, so that the angle formed by the frontal plane and the arm remains fairly constant. This sort of constancy may be individual. Two subjects asked to trace a circle with a piece of chalk on a plane parallel to the frontal plane generally do it according to different methods, the arm extended or the elbow bent, characteristic to each one of them. If one asks a subject to show his hand, he will not present it in just any position. The palm will ordinarily be turned down, the fingers slightly flexed, thumb above the other fingers and the hand at the height of the middle of the body. It is rather well known that everyone has his own manner of carrying his head and his position of sleeping. Finally, perceptual behavior also has preferred determinations. An angle of 93 degrees is designated as a quote-unquote bad right angle. The musician speaks of quote-unquote false notes. Any behavior which is not preferred will be judged by the subject as difficult or imperfect behavior. 
but what is it that confers, confers their preference on preferred modes of behavior? How does it happen that they are treated as, quote, the simplest, unquote, and, quote, the most natural, unquote, that they give a feeling of balance and facility? Is the orientation toward these preferred modes of behavior comparable to the formation of a spherical soap bubble? In the latter case, the external forces exerted on the surface of the bubble tend to compress it into a point. The pressure of the enclosed air, on the other hand, demands as large a volume as possible. The spherical structure which is realized represents the only possible solution to this problem of minimum and maximum. Can it be said in the same way that the preferred modes of behavior of an organism are those which, in the de facto conditions in which it finds itself, objectively offer the greatest simplicity, the greatest unity, but most of the time they do not have any privilege of simplicity or of unity in themselves. Uh, yeah, I guess I'll stop there. Um, so, you know, what Merleau-Ponty Merleau is trying to show here is that the equilibrium which characterizes vital behavior is not continuous with the kind of equilibria found in physical behavior. I apologize if you can hear my cat sneezing. Um, the kind of preference demonstrated, or the preference that we that is observable in the behavior of living beings um, has an element of preference to it, which you obviously can't be observed in in physical phenomena like the formation of a soap bubble. And I think more broadly, if the if Merleau-Ponty can show that vital forms are not continuous with physical forms, then um, that would go a long way to uh, showing that the Gestaltist idea of isomorphism, which is you know a kind of physical reductionism, um, is not as viable as Gestalt psychology would would like it to be. Yeah, I think so. Like this is sort of connected with. Um what he's gone through in detail in the previous chapter um, about how the um, analysis of behavior in animals, including human beings, um, has to look at not just the physical properties, like, you know, what is the, um, you know, physically measured temperature and air pressure and, you know, what wavelengths of light is striking the retina and so on, but um, a sort of uh, what this um, perceptual uh, experience means for the organism uh in terms of you know um uh whether it um indicates the presence of a predator or uh the presence of uh, a food source etc um um so yeah so you can't so in the case of like a physical system like this um soap bubble example uh you don't have to sort of analyze what the uh, pressure of the air inside the bubble and the surface tension of the soap mean for the bubble it doesn't mean anything it just sort of uh there's just this, this physical process of minimization of uh of the surface tension um that that brings about this shape uh you don't have to sort of look at you don't have to sort of figure out what the perspective of the soap bubble on this process is whereas in the case of um you know even something relatively simple like uh you know a rat trying to navigate a maze you have to figure out like um what aspects of this maze are relevant to the rat, what, which ones does it sort of take account of, uh, and then which ones does it ignore or that sort of don't have an impact on the rat's behavior. Um, and uh, um, yeah, maybe another way of putting it, so he, he talks here about like this contrast between the actual and the virtual. So in a, in a physical system, you only ever have to take account of the actual processes going on. So like in the soap bubble example, there there is an actual um, Sort of degree of surface tension. Uh, you have this, you know, uh, you know, actual forces between the molecules of of soap that bring about this spherical shape. Um, whereas in the case of uh, animal behavior, you have to look at not just the actual um, uh, sort of um, physical influence of the environment on the sense organs of the animal, but also the sort of uh, potential, the virtual um, set of other. Um, States that the animal could be in. So, like one of the examples that he he talked about uh, in the previous chapter was the case of this uh, chicken presented with the two um, the two different shades of gray and the food sources um, that are labeled with these two different sources uh, two different shades of gray. Um, so here, 
the, the chicken responds not to this wavelength of light striking its retina, but to the contrast between the two, um, the two different shades of gray. And even when you change the pair of shades completely, it still sort of uh, grasps the, the contrast between a lighter and a darker and, and, and responds appropriately. Um, so it, it, when you're trying to um, uh, explain the behavior of this chicken, um, the, physical, the, the actual physical wavelength of light striking the retina of the chicken is um, sort of irrelevant or, or is, a, is a secondary consideration as opposed to the, the contrast, so the, the you know, potential or virtual presence of this other shade of gray um, and the distinction between the two, this difference between the two. And, and that difference is not a, a sort of physical property of the environment, it's a, a sort of um, virtual, uh, uh, you know, possibility of a different shade being present, and, and so the chicken is responding to the fact that one rather than the other is present uh, in this location, as opposed to just responding directly to the the one uh, physical wavelength of light striking its retina. Um, and so, like, w this is sort of a general property of explanation at the vital uh, the vital level is that you have to sort of account. For you have you have to account for the behavior of organisms in terms of not just what is physically present, but what other uh, possibilities are not present. Um, you know what what other um, possible behaviors of the organism are not actually realized. Um, so so this is uh, yeah something um, yeah so this this is something that is uh, distinct from uh, a physical explanation. So we we can't sort of. Uh, this sort of this isomorphism that the Gestalt psychology people are trying to propose is actually not quite as isomorphic as they um, as they want it to be. Uh, yes, and yeah, so Angus has put in the chat here. Yeah, th so this is something that would be true even at the syncretic level. And, and yes, I think that's right. Uh, so yeah, the worm that the toad sees uh, is not just um, uh, a sort of um, you know physical um, set of uh, uh, wavelengths of light striking the toad's retina, but the toad recognizes the you know, worm shape uh, object in front of it, um, uh, and then responds in a way that is appropriate for worm shaped objects. Uh, yeah, so there's a sort of essence of the worm. So it's 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 not just you know this wavelength of light strikes the retina, but it's like this color contrast of uh, a sort of cylindrical object against a, a darker background. Um, you know, sort of uh, releases the worm grasping behavior. Um, uh, so yeah, it's it's like a this sort of um, perceptual shape of a worm, which is uh, you know distinct from I don't know the shape of a fly or some other object that it would respond to in a different way. Uh, okay, so we can go on to the the next page. Uh, Sixty one. Do you have uh, a mic today? Are, are you uh, are you able to read the next bit? Uh, okay. Yeah, uh, I can I can read this one then. Uh, yeah. So uh, we're at the top of uh, one forty seven. When I turn my head toward a source of sound in such a way that, in fact, the auditive excitations become synchronized at the level of the two ears, the process of excitation, considered part by part, is no simpler than before. It appears so only if one looks for an ensemble in it, for a whole expressible by a unique law, and finally only by means of a resemblance with a model of simplicity which our mind suggests. It is not because behavior is simple that it is preferred. On the contrary, it is because it is preferred that we find it simpler. If one tried to hold with Köhler that preferred behavior is that involving the least expenditure of energy, besides the fact that its economic character is not objectively established, it is too clear that the organism is not a machine governed according to a principle of absolute economy. For the most part, preferred behavior is the simplest and most economical with respect to the task in which the organism finds itself engaged. And its fundamental forms of activity and the character of its possible action are presupposed in the definition of the structures which will be the simplest for it, preferred in it. In certain patients, any passive movement of the head toward the right entails displacements of the members of the body in the same direction, but disassociation remains possible in the face of any concrete task which demands it. The reactions evoked by a stimulus depend upon the significance which it has for the organism considered not as a group of forces which tend toward rest by the shortest paths, but as a being capable of certain types of action. In the act of quote-unquote pointing out the preferred plane where the arm moves, far from being determined by the conditions of a physical equilibrium with the milieu, corresponds to the internal necessities of a vital equ equilibrium. It depends not on local conditions, but on the total activity of the organism. Uh, I think this is a long quote. No, sorry. Uh, okay. All the sensory stimuli, tactual, visual, and auditive, as it were, attract the preferred plane in their direction. 
all movements of the body proper, whether of the head, the opposite arm, the eyes, or the legs, modify it. These motor conditions are no less efficacious when they are not perceived by the subject. The same movement will displace the preferred plane in two opposed directions according to the significance which this movement has for the subject. For example, a displacement of the eyes towards the right uh, pushes the preferred plane back toward the left if this displacement is gratuitous and without object. It draws it toward the right, however, if the subject turns his eyes in order to look at something. In reality, it is only by abstraction that we can speak of preferred behavior as if it were a question of local phenomena which ought to be explained one by one. Each preferred behavior is inseparable from the others and is united with it. It would seem that a lowering of tonus in one half of the organism should entail disorders of perception and of action. As a matter of fact, it would entail them if the subject did not unknowingly incline his head or even his entire body toward the injured side. In this attitude, he does not fall, uh, walks upright and perceives object, objectively vertical lines as vertical. The disorders reappear if the subject is obliged to hold his head up straight. Thus, through the slight slanting of the head, the course of the excitation in the whole organism has actually become ordered. In brief, what is preferred in the healthy organism as well as the, in the sick one is not a certain position of the head on the one hand and a certain tonic gradient on the other, but a, a determinate relation of the one to the other. Uh, okay, I'll stop here. Um, yeah, maybe uh, so another example of this sort of phenomenon that uh, he doesn't mention here, but he, he talks about in um, the phenomenology of perception is this uh, experiment uh, this sort of famous experiment with these uh, inverting goggles. Um, so they, they have these like goggles with this mirror apparatus that inverts the image on the subject's eye. So everything is upside down. Um, um, and so the, the subjects had to wear these goggles for, I think, like a few weeks or, or several days. I can't remember exactly how long. Um, but uh, so at first, of course, they see everything upside down, as you would expect. Um, but after a certain amount of time, they start to um, Sort of, uh, you know, experience things as as being normal. Uh, the, the things don't look upside down anymore. Um, and uh, he 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 also points out that specifically it's the um, objects that they interact with that first start to look normal. So like the the faucet uh, on on a sink looks normal as you when you use it. Um, uh, but then if you say like sort of look out the window at the uh, the street scene, then things still look upside down. Uh, uh, so, um, what uh, you know, the interpretation of this is that um, the what's important about the um, or sorry, the the perception of the orientation of objects is not some sort of uh, objective um, correspondence between the optical image on the retina and you know whatever is going on outside outside the body um, in in the physical objects outside the body. Um, it's uh, a sort of um, uh, I guess practical orientation of the organism. It's like what sort of um, uh, like how does the organism interact with these objects um, on the basis of receiving uh, you know uh, perceptual information about the layout of these objects? Uh, and so like the uh, the objective orientation of the uh, image projected onto the retina is more or less irrelevant to that process. Uh, uh, you know, it, it it doesn't really matter if the image is um, you know right side up from the sort of normal perspective or upside down. Uh, uh, once the subject is able to sort of grasp the relationship between um, its actions, its manipulation of the objects on the one hand, and the uh, perceived uh, object on the other hand, then everything you know from the perspective of that subject seems to be right side up or normal. It just it, it just doesn't sort of uh, experience any um, alteration of the orientation as long as its manipulation of those objects is proceeding as normal. Um, so, so here, like, there, there's no reason to think that there's like a physical process of minimization of energy going on in your nervous system that brings about uh, sort of a, uh, you know, the experience of um, objects as being right side up. There, there's no evidence that this is the case. It, it, it would be purely uh, hypothetical to, to suppose this, um, uh, and in particular, like it, it would be very hard to explain how this min minimization process would be capable of uh, bringing about the experience of everything looking right side up, uh, both in the normal case when you have no goggles on, and in the case of the uh, inverted goggles. That somehow the same process brings about, or so, yeah, somehow the minimization process brings about the 
experience of everything being oriented correctly in, in both cases, uh, th this is, seems hard to understand how that would work. Um, uh, we instead have to understand this uh, process by means of which everything comes to look right side up, uh, even with the inverted goggles. Um, we understand this in terms of the organism as an agent that is responding to the world in some uh, appropriate way. It tries to perform certain tasks and uh, it, its uh, grasp of elements of the world or aspects of the world is, uh, is sort of brought about in relation to those tasks. Um, and so this sort of process of uh, perceptual uh, reorientation through which the, the inverted image of the world comes to be experienced as actually right side up, um, this whole process is only understandable in terms of uh, in terms of the organism as uh, an agent trying to achieve uh, uh, a goal or trying to perform certain tasks as opposed to as a, a sort of physical uh, energy minimization or, or some similar process like that. So it's this um, uh, sort of meaning structured um, nature of the, of the process that is uh, something that, that, is, that is not isomorphic to the physical process that has no relation to you know, the soap bubble is not an agent trying to perform a task. It's just uh, a, a set of molecules that have different interactions with each other uh, and, 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 you know, bring about this uh, spherical shape through the interaction of those molecules through physical forces, um, as opposed to the, the human subject uh, with the goggles that um, is uh, an agent trying to perform tasks in relation to the world around them. Uh, so it, it's that sort of lack of isomorphism that, that he's pointing to here. Uh, one thing I find interesting about the argument in this section is that this is obviously continuous with the points that he's been making throughout the book. Um, but, you know, this idea that uh, there is no pure, it's the activity of the organism. Um, in a way, the organism decides, uh, obviously not arbitrarily, but sort of decides what the situation will be for it. Um, in a task specific way, at least. Uh, but in the beginning of the book, he's sort of arguing alongside Gestalt psychology um, against behaviorism. Um, but in this chapter, he's making the same arguments, um, but sort of, you know, they're arguments that are, I, I think, probably originally from Gestalt psychology, uh, but now turned against it and, you know, showing that. Uh, its own Gestalt psychology principles are incompatible with this idea of isomorphism and the uh, the kind of reductive physicalism um, that they end up at. I'm sorry, just a second. Um, yeah, uh, yeah. I think one, at least one element of his argument throughout this book is essentially just sort of pushing Gestalt psychology sort of beyond itself, um, like saying, like taking the concepts of Gestalt psychology that are sort of um, isolated at the level of uh, perceptual experience um, and then sort of, uh, yeah, taking those concepts um, as, uh, as like, or I'll put it another way, that uh, trying, to, trying to separate those concepts from the um, physical explanations that the Gestalt psychologists apply to, to them. Um, so like, yeah, so in Gestalt psychology, there's this um, identification of uh, the, the, the form uh, character of perceptual experience, the fact that um, you can only understand, uh, uh, you know, the way that organisms respond to the environment insofar as those elements of the environment are relevant to it, uh, to its life and, and its activities and so on. Um, but this sort of um, uh, account of animal behavior in, in the Gestalt psychologist is always accompanied by this um, sort of uh, retention of this physical level as being uh, ultimately what's fundamental. Um, so, of course, the, there's this experiential, uh, perceptual world, but ultimately it's sort of anchored in uh, the world uh, of physical laws. Um, and what Mechle Ponty is doing here is sort of uh, cutting the tie to, to that um, presupposed physical world and, and sort of starting from the... the, uh, the experiential world and and you know trying to uh sort of push those concepts to uh 
to uh you know to the limit uh and 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 not see them as like um sort of secondary to this uh physical world that is given before the experiential world yeah what exactly the connection of this is with the uh with Husserl's concept of the epoche the uh uh you know bracketing of the physical world etc um i think is a, an interesting question uh and he, he does talk about this a bit in uh the preface of the um phenomenology of perception um but uh yeah so it's uh it's yeah i guess it's uh sort of being at the level of the experiential as opposed to presupposing that uh the experiential is like uh grounded in something uh uh you know not experiential if, if that makes sense I do think it's a it's a very um, strong argument that the you know guess, obviously Gestalt psychology itself insists on uh, the this formal unity of the perceptual situation, um, but the the uh, isomorphism seems to return to a, a kind of like co- more compositional, um, like a you know the parts preceding the whole. Um, understanding of that situation and it it is at least to me it's not clear how those two uh aspects of gestalt are supposed to work together i know that's kind of the thrust of Merleau ponty's argument but i've i find that pretty convincing um yeah well i mean he does he does talk about like even at the level of physical uh laws and physical interactions and so on there there are things like um uh, like an electromagnetic field, for example, um, where so the charge at one point is uh, dependent on the charge at other points in the field and, and, and vice versa. So if you change one uh, charge or you introduce a charge in, at one point in the field, it affects all the other points of the field. Uh, uh, so there's this, in that sense, there's a sort of, uh, yeah, holistic um, nature of, of something like an electromagnetic field. Um, uh, and and it was, I think, in appe- appealing to something like this that the Gestalt psychologists thought they could sort of um, uh, overcome that kind of compositional aspect. So, like, it's it's not a sort of mechanistic picture of the world where you have this one sort of atom uh, that is given in isolation from everything else, and then another atom, uh, and then you sort of figure out how they combine with each other to to form something uh, bigger or more complicated, etc. Um, so that you would have these these fields or these um, uh, you know, principles governing uh, the evolution of physical systems uh, that would have this sort of interactive and um, yeah, holistic uh, character. Um, and and it was because of this that they thought they could make this identification of these principles with the the um, principles governing the perceptual world or the world of experience. Um, so it's, it's not so much that the the physical explanation is compositional. Um, it's more that um, the the physical processes are uh, are only responsive to actual events and actual properties. So uh, it's only the fact that there actually is this charge present uh, that you know makes this field have this strength and this orientation and so on. Um, uh, the field doesn't sort of respond to the contrast between this charge and another charge that could be there, whereas the chicken is responding to the contrast between one shade of gray and a different shade of gray. Um, uh, and so like the chicken is, and any other organism is sort of um, uh, responsive, not just to the physical um, elements of the environment that, that are actually present, but to the absence of other um, elements that could be present. Uh, and so, yes, yeah, it's, it's this contrast element to, uh, to, um, that is necessary to understand the behavior of organisms that I think is the the key element of why these sort of the vital and the physical level are are not actually isomorphic? I think that's the sort of the key um, the key piece of of the argument here. Yeah, I totally agree about the um, holism and the in the physical world for Gestalt. I guess I was just thinking of the how to get to the whole of the perceptual situation from um, physical elements, which I, I guess I don't. What I, I don't understand how that wouldn't end up being a kind of atomism, um, even if they're kind of structures all the way down uh, for the isomorphism argument. Yeah, I think um, like 
uh, I think it was at the end of the last chapter, he, he gave sort of like a very compressed, um, um, uh, I guess, sketch of what he's going to do in the rest of the book, but his, his sort of uh, high level, like abstract objection to the, the way that Gestalt psychology treats the relationship between the physical and the vital levels uh, is that it itself sort of treats them as two um, like uh, atoms, like, that, like you know, the, there's the physical level, which has its properties and the vital level, which has its properties. And then we sort of secondarily like compare the two and find this isomorphism between them. Um, and uh, what he's going to try to do is to give uh, this more sort of uh, complicated um, form account of the relationship between the two, that somehow the, the relationship between the physical and the vital uh, levels is itself characterized by this form property that is identifiable within the vital level. Um, so yeah, so it's sort of applying the form concept from Gestalt psychology to the um, the sort of relationship between the physical and the vital that Gestalt psychology still um, kept at this sort of atomistic uh, uh, state or like understood in this atomistic uh, form. Right. Yeah. I guess that's. I guess it, it's this continuity versus discontinuity. Um, yeah, that makes sense. So if it's if you can show that they're the vital is not continuous with the physical, then um, arguably isomorphism doesn't work. But um, I can read the next page or so. Yeah, let's do one more reading and discussion section, and then we can uh, end there. Okay, that sounds good. Are we at since the same remarks? Uh, yes. Okay. Since the same remarks could be made with regard to the typical attitudes of each subject, one is led to the idea that there exists a general structure of behavior for each individual, which is expressed by certain kinds of conduct, of sensible and motor thresholds, of affectivity, of temperature, of blood pressure, in such a way that it is impossible to find causes and effects in this ensemble. Each particular phenomenon expressing equally well what one could call the quote-unquote essence of the individual. For the preferred behavior is the one which permits the easiest and most adapted action. For example, the most exact spatial designations, the finest sensory discriminations. Thus, each organism in the presence of a given milieu has its optimal conditions of activity in its proper manner of realizing equilibrium. And the internal determinants of this equilibrium are not given by a plurality of vectors, by a general attitude toward the world. This is the reason why inorganic structures can be expressed by a law while organic structures are understood only by a norm, by a certain type of transitive action which characterizes the individual. The thresholds of perception in an organism, as we were saying, are among the individual constants which express its essence. This signifies that the organism itself measures the action of things upon it and itself delimits its milieu by a circular process which is without analogy in the physical world. The relations of the organic individual and its milieu are truly dialectical relations, therefore, and this dialectic brings about the appearance of new relations which cannot be compared to those of a physical system and its entourage, or even understood when the organism is reduced to the image which anatomy and the physical sciences give of it. Even its elementary reactions cannot be classified, as we said, according to the apparatuses in which they are realized, but according to their vital significance. Some obtain equilibrium at the least cost, and in this sense come closer to a physical process. These are local sensations which prevent the excitant from becoming harmful, or from being harmful. But others carry out a genuine work on the outside, in which the whole organism is engaged. Thus it would be necessary to distinguish an immediate behavior and an objective behavior. The difference between abduction and extensor movements, which in fact seem rather to be bound up with the activity of the medulla and adduction and flexor movements, which depend rather on the cerebral cortex, is not expressible by these anatomical designations nor by any physical notion. The science of life can be constructed only with notions tailored to it and taken from our experience of a living being. It will be noticed, for instance, that movements of extension are particularly frequent with regard to objects to which we do not pay attention. Yawning and the act of sneezing are movements of pure extension, and inversely, all precise movements in opposition to movements of force uh, sorry, are flexor movements. Thus, the true distinction between them is that of, quote, different attitude of the organism toward, 
to the world, unquote. Flexion is an attitude in which the organism takes possession of the world, as is seen by the example of the movements of convergence and fixation, and by the inclination of the head and attention. On the contrary, extensor movements express abandonment to things, and the passive existence of an organism which does not master its milieu. Inspiration movements, more accentuated in a passive attitude, are bound up with extension behavior in animals and even in man. On the contrary, expiration movements greater in man during meditation are a particular case of flexion. An analysis of this does not follow the articulations of anatomy. A convulsive contraction of the flexors is not an act of flexion. The biological value of an organism is not recognized purely and simply by the organs which it uses. It cannot be understood in the language of anatomy. Thus, one should anticipate finding a regulation in the behavior of the simplest organisms, which is different from that in physical systems. In fact, tropisms, which were long considered to be reactions to the physical and chemical agents of the milieu, do not seem to exist in this form in the normal, in the normal life conditions of the animal. Positive phototropism in young place does not take place in a large aquarium. The sea anemone placed on a trellis sends its pedicle downward, and if the trellis is turned over several times, the pedicle and laces the meshes of the trellis. But after a certain number of trials, the animal disengages its pedicles and will settle itself in the sand, which is to say that here again, behavior cannot be defined as an adaptation to the given conditions and the organism itself poses the conditions of its equilibrium. Tropisms and lobe sense would represent laboratory reactions similar to those of a man whose conduct is disorganized by emotion and who runs toward the light or the dark. Um, yeah, this, the point in that first paragraph is that there's something like an essence of the individual for, um, you know, vital form of behavior. I think it's like just an easy example of this is just, um, you know, cats, for instance, entirely different personalities from one another, uh, in a way that obviously we it wouldn't make any sense to talk about one soap bubble having a certain attitude and another not. I don't totally understand this point about extension and flexion, but it seems to be that maybe the extent, the extensor movements are some, the, the closer to the most physical uh, pole of the behavior of the organism, whereas the flexor movements are more associated with intentional action and um, express this, what he calls this dialectical relation work uh, with the milieu. Yeah, I think this bit about, yeah, flexion versus extension is maybe a little bit um, exaggerated here or like maybe reading a bit too much into this. Uh, but I think like maybe we can think of like, um, uh, yeah, for example, there are many, um, uh, many animals that have like a, a sort of reflex of flicking their ears when you touch the ear, uh, which is um, often related to the fact that um, uh, you have like flies and other things that land on the ear and uh, uh, you know uh, draw blood from the animal and you know the ears have uh, thin skin and lots of blood vessels so they're like a sort of attractive target for mosquitoes and so on. Um, so like uh, yeah, um, so there's um, this sort of uh, reflexive reaction of yeah flicking the ear. Um, which is just a sort of response to this point stimulus of you know the 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 touch that is is like similar to a mosquito or a fly landing on the ear, uh, and then likewise you have like other um, similar reactions um, where like uh, you know a, 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 I don't know a heat sensation at one point will will like yeah so if you touch a, a pot that's too hot for example your hand will uh, withdraw um, uh, without you even sort of thinking about it you don't have to like think, oh, this pot is hot, my hand will be damaged, therefore I'm going to move my hand. You just sort of withdraw your hand before you even realize that you've touched something hot. Um, uh, so this is a kind of, I mean, this is not a sort of a purely um, extension movement in the way that uh, Mehul Ponzi is talking about it here, but it's this kind of response where you have this sort of point stimulus and uh, a reaction that sort of acts in such a way as to um, protect the organism from this point stimulus. I think this is the type of action he's talking about here. Um, uh, it's it's a like this kind of response to a stimulus is a sort of disaggregated response. It doesn't really connect in any specific way with like the goals and tasks of the organism or whatever the organism is trying to achieve. It just 
happens uh, without the organism having to um, sort of uh, you know make a decision or like evaluate what the best option is or something like that. Uh, whereas other actions, like when you think of I don't know a bird picking picking up a twig and bringing it back to it to build a nest, this is clearly um, a response to uh, this is like uh, a way that the bird is um, uh, grasping some element of the world and incorporating it into an ongoing project or an ongoing task. Uh, uh, and this is a very different kind of, uh, uh, yeah, it's a very different kind of response to the environment compared to, yeah, just, just sort of flicking your ear or withdrawing your hand from a, a hot stove or whatever. Um, so, um, yeah, when, when we sort of compare these two types of movement, uh, we, we have to understand them in, in very different ways compared to, like, Obviously, the soap bubble. There's no like um, you never have to interpret the soap bubble's uh, evolution through time as uh, a relationship to uh, an ongoing project or an ongoing task. Uh, you never have to um, yeah connect what happens to the soap bubble with what the soap bubble is trying to do. Uh, um, so yeah, the 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 uh, interpretation of animal behavior involves this. Um, uh, at least in some cases, involves um, this kind of uh, connection with with a, a project uh, and a task in a way that it doesn't um, that isn't required when you're when you're interpreting the or or when you're trying to explain uh, how a physical system develops through time. And this is again like when he points to these uh, the the next bit about the tropisms. So like yeah, so the the sort of um, uh, stock examples of tropisms are like um, like phototropism, either you know. Uh, aiming towards the light, like moths, for example, that fly towards a, a, a candle or an electric light, um, or there are other organisms that are uh, uh, that uh, you know hide from the light, that they they move away from the light. Um, um, but uh, what uh, what he's arguing here is that this sort of tro tropism behavior is like uh, sort of a um, an artificial production of a laboratory environment, or or this the idea that there would be like this sort of very direct, um, uh, like I don't know, linear relationship between like uh, light presence in one location and then uh, the behavior of the organism to move towards or away from the light um, is sort of an oversimplification because uh, even that sort of very simple moving away or towards the light uh, behavior uh, depends on the general circumstances of the organism uh and and so like this anemone example it uh it uh you know tries to move downwards so it has this like uh tropism related to gravity um um but yeah so uh if you so you, you put the anemone on the trellis it's uh it's i don't know tentacles or whatever grow downwards uh through the trellis and then you flip the trellis over uh and then it, it goes it grows downward again and so it, it sort of loops around the trellis uh, and you do this a couple times, and eventually the anemone, instead of just continuing to grow in the direction down, no matter which way the, the trellis is oriented, eventually it detaches from the trellis and goes to the bottom of the cage and, and uh, settles in the ground. Uh, so here, uh, at some point, the, the anemone is kind of, I guess, uh, responding to the fact that it's not, um, that it, it's, you know, the down direction uh, determined by gravity is not sort of, uh, bringing about the desired result or the the sort of normal results of uh settling in the in the soil uh, or in the the sand at the bottom of the of the ocean um uh it somehow sort of recognizes that the the down signal is no longer reliable for the the goal state of being anchored in the sand uh and then it um you know detaches from this trellis and uh and um you know you know reaches the sand uh, in a less normal way um, so here, this like um, what seems to be like a simple physical response to gravity that it, it would just grow in the direction of gravity uh, actually turns out to be like a, a sort of use of the direction of gravity as a signal for um, where where I can anchor myself. Uh, sort of um, uh, yeah. So like it, it's a it's a response to an element of the environment as having a value or a. a you know, uh, a utility for this organism in some sense, as opposed to just this sort of purely uh, physical reaction to um, the effect of a force on on an organism. Yeah, Angus, do you want to explain your your comment? Uh, 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 yeah, I, I'm just mindful of the fact that you uh, 
went into stuff a little bit early today. Um, yeah, I can just say it. It, and then we can end, end after that. Oh, okay, oh, that's good. Um, yeah, at a few places in individuation, um, Simon Don argues that uh, he argues against cybernetics uh, that the living being can't be understood just as a homeostat, and his argument seems, as I remember it, seems similar to the point that uh, Merleau Ponty is here about absolute economy and task re- task related um, efficiency, which is that the living being can can uh, in a way decide uh, its I, I guess its comportment toward the milieu. Um, it can sort of change have a change its um its direction or its sense um in a way that can't be understood just as maintaining uh equilibrium in the way that a homeostat does which is much closer to the physical uh the physical equilibrium merleau ponty is discussing here yeah so like you can think of um like there are Certain, you know, fish and birds, for example, and insects even that that migrate um, across thousands of kilometers. Um, that you know, they're they're born in one location, then they they swim uh, thousands of kilometers across the ocean and up up a river to to spawn uh, where they where their parents came from. Um, uh, so, like to understand this in terms of like a minimization of energy is, is like, or or you know, reaching an equilibrium or something like that seems like pretty absurd. Um, the you know the, the organism is expending a huge amount of energy to um, to you know travel to uh, another location for example um, um, so so yeah it's it like clearly here the like in one sense you could you could sort of you know describe this in terms of like uh, sort of like a, a I don't know a, a perceptual or behavioral tension that like you know the the organism has like a drive towards a location. And it tries to reduce its, you know, tension of being separated from that location or something like that. Um, but like, this is clearly not the same kind of uh, process as like the soap bubble minimization of energy process, because it only makes sense to describe the organism in terms of this tension, uh, insofar as you recognize um, the the organism as as being directed toward uh, something as, as like, uh, yeah, as as uh, engaged in. Uh, a project or a task uh and, and so here th- this is something co- completely different like a, a soap bubble never sort of you know migrates or like you know uh, uh yeah expends energy to to travel to a different location or whatever it just uh is affected by you know uh air currents and so on um but it, it doesn't like have a project of reaching a certain location uh okay uh yeah so i think um if there are no other um comments or or questions uh we can wrap up here for today All right yeah thanks everyone for uh your contributions and we will continue from page one yeah 150 uh next time